our scripture reading, and I invite you to stand for the scripture reading. It is found in Acts chapter 4, chapter 1, chapter one verses 4 through 8. Acts 1, 4 through 8. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Please be seated. Well, we all have needs of one sort or another, and these needs can vary. Certainly, we all have our basic needs of food, shelter, and clothing, but we also have needs of fellowship. At this time of year, we have needs of being warm, but I believe that God wants to help us to understand what our most important need is, and I don't know if we have the slide up there, Nick, if we can get the slide up there. And, uh, but our most urgent need is what I would like to speak about this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It's my prayer that the grace and the power of your Holy Spirit would be with us. And as we open your word today, may our hearts be open to you to search our hearts and to give us understanding. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our most urgent need. I want to invite you to go to our scripture reading that Fred read to us just a few moments ago. And the scripture reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And it reads, <clears throat> And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, this particular passage of Scripture ought to have great relevance to us as a people. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We look forward to the second coming of Jesus. During the Christmas season, of course, Christians throughout the world celebrate the first Advent. But we have to remember He has promised to come again. Amen? And that, especially uh, in this particular time we're living in, uh, the COVID virus has engulfed the world, and there's just been a lot of challenges worldwide in the political world, in the social world, and, and so on and so forth, so that it has drawn the attention of many people throughout the world saying, what is next? What is coming next? Very appropriate children's story about that uh, reference to the second coming headlines, Fred, that you told just moments ago. And so we, as a Seventh-day Adventist people, have, and Christians throughout, those who may be of other faith persuasions watching us on Facebook or YouTube, this is relevant to you as well. But the idea being is that this particular passage does talk about the second coming, but it also talks about our most urgent need. And let me explain. If you go to the passage of Scripture here in Acts, 
chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Notice that Jesus gives a command. And what is this command about? Well, he says, he gathered them together, they were all assembled, and he commanded them. He didn't suggest, he didn't, um, you know, give a, a, some sort of a, just an idea that, hey, I'm just throwing this idea out, maybe you might be interested, maybe not, I don't know. But the Bible says he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So Jesus had previously spoken about this promise that the Father was going to uh, give to, to the disciples. And he went on to explain, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now that sounds exciting. Because the disciples, you have to remember, had been through a lot in recent days. This is just a mere, uh, just a few weeks after Jesus had been crucified. And that whole incident, the crucifixion, had been kind of the culmination of a lot of events. And it came to this climax where Jesus is arrested, he's put on trial, and then he's crucified and he's buried. The difference, the only real thing that made it life-changing was that he was resurrected. If he would still be in the tomb, would we all be here today? No. So the difference was the resurrection. And so Jesus, though, speaks to his disciples as they're gathered here, and he says, listen, I want you to wait here. And I want you to wait for the promise of my Father, which I had told you about. And John had spoken about it, and many of them had been disciples of John as well. So they were familiar with this promise. But notice what takes place next. If you look at the verse, it says in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, when will we receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is that what it says? No. If you're looking at your Bibles and reading them correctly, it says, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So even though Jesus had this sense of urgency, he commanded them to stay there and to wait for this promise, their attention was not rooted or grounded in what he had to say to them. They immediately, like they had done on many other occasions, changed the subject. And this is what they do at this time. They change the subject from this most urgent need that Jesus says that you have. And they change the subject to, when's the kingdom going to come? Are you going to restore it now? You, you, we thought you were going to restore it before you were crucified. Now that you've been crucified and, and resurrected, are you going to do it now? But does Jesus follow their lead with this change of subject? Does Jesus uh, engage with them on this change of subject? Say, well, you know, you, you got a good point here. Uh, maybe we ought to talk about that for a moment and have a committee meeting about that. No, watch what Jesus does. Listen to what Jesus does. Verse 7, And he said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now that's not to say that the second coming is not important. But, he said, it's not for us to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. And he redirects their attention with this statement. 
but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now let's stop and think about that for a moment. Because here's this ragtag group of disciples, some fishermen, some tax collectors, and an sundry other bit of professions thrown in. And he tells them, you're going to be my witnesses in Judea, excuse me, in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria. But he takes it even further, really beyond the scope of their imagination. And he says, to the ends of the earth. They knew about Jerusalem. They had gathered there for the religious festivals. They had dwelt in the Judean area. Some of them were from Galilee, Peter and others, James and John. They had traveled with Jesus to Samaria. The Bible doesn't say whether prior to this time that these disciples had traveled beyond this area, but they had heard of Rome and so on. But he tells them, you're going to be my witnesses. Now we need to stop and think here for a moment about how serious, how dramatic, how life-changing this really is. Because I want to just take a brief little survey here of three passages in the book of Acts that really illustrate for us how life-changing this promise is. Because without this promise being fulfilled, there's no Christian witness. It's game over before it even starts. Okay. And so what we have to do is just really stop and think about what Jesus is saying here. He's commanding them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for this promise. And what is the value? What is the importance? What is the urgency of the promise? That, and here's what it is. Without this promise, there's no power. None whatsoever. No power to be a witness for Jesus. Why would someone testify about Jesus without the power of Jesus? I want to just take you, like I said, on this brief survey and think about this passage, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the story of Pentecost. And in Pentecost, what happened was that the disciples and uh, had been gathered there in Jerusalem, and uh, Jewish believers from all over the world and the empire had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And it was a very strategic event that God did by pouring out the Holy Spirit at that time. Because there were believers, Jewish believers, from all over, and when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened, it caught the attention of all of these visitors because then people started speaking in their native tongues. And when that happened, it arrested the attention of everybody to where they thought, well, what's going on? What's this phenomena that's happening? And some people thought that uh, what was going on was so strange that people thought people were drunk. And it was Peter who got up and said, time out. Nobody's drunk here. But let me explain what is going on. This is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And he went on to explain. And the Bible tells us that there were 3,000 people who were baptized that day. All because the disciples were willing to be obedient. 
and instead of trying to change the subject like they had already done one time, they finally submitted themselves to the instructions of Jesus. And when they obeyed, something phenomenal happened. Pentecost happened. It would not have happened had they not obeyed. Acts chapter 4 tells of another story. This is, of course, at Pentecost. But what happened was that in Acts chapter 3, there was a lame man. I believe it was Acts chapter... Yeah, let's just go there just to make sure. Yes, in Acts chapter 3, the lame man was healed. Uh, Peter and John had gone up into the temple to worship and to pray. And what happened was there was a man who used to be there and he was begging. He was lame. He was uh, in his feet. And he had looked at Peter. He got Peter's attention and uh, was suggesting perhaps with his eyes, with his voice, that Peter would give him some money to assist him with some financial needs. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And this man stood up on his feet and walked. And the man was so taken aback by this whole experience, he began you know, jumping around for joy, giving thanks. And so what ended up happening was that Peter began preaching. And as a result of that, they were put under house arrest by the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders. And that's what happens in Acts chapter 4. They're arrested. And what they end up doing was they have to appear before the high priest and they began interrogating them and they say, listen, we don't want this type of preaching going on. You cut it out right now. Now, when Peter was confronted in a previous experience prior to the resurrection of Jesus. What was his experience? Did he stand bravely before the little servant girl? Or did he cower in his boots and lie and deny that he ever knew Jesus? You know how that story went. He denied his Lord. He denied that he ever knew his Lord, even though he had spent three years working with him in public ministry. But here's what happened this time. They said <coughs> in Acts chapter 4, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And now is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's a pretty bold statement from this, what once used to be a cowardly fisherman. And what's even more impressive, too, is the observation that Luke records of how these individuals saw Peter and John. Verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Pentecost would not have happened without the disciples following the instructions of Jesus. That lame man who sat there for years at the temple would never have been healed had the disciples not been faithful to what their Lord had commanded them. Peter would not have had the courage to preach 
as he did, both on Pentecost as well as here, without the unction of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, and there's many, many examples in the book of Acts. But let's just go to this last one here, Acts chapter 8 and 9. Acts chapter 8 and 9. And here it says in the beginning in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and this is following on the death of Stephen. Stephen had just been martyred. He had been stoned to death. And what had taken place next was that Luke makes the observation, now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So this is basically our first introduction to Saul. And what is this character Saul like? Is he a nice person or is he somebody that the Christians really need to try to avoid at all cost? He's somebody that they need to avoid. And the reason is, is because he persecutes the church. He's zealous for God but he's so zealous for God that he's blind to what God is trying to say to him through his word, and so he persecutes the church to the point of dragging off both men and women and hauling them off to prison. Until Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, this same character, Saul, is on the road to Damascus. And we have the story of Saul's conversion to the Apostle Paul. But it would never be possible without this. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, after... Uh, the Lord had instructed Ananias to go and meet with Saul, who was converted to Paul. And the Bible tells us in verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Listen to this. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me <coughs> that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. You see, friends, the Holy Spirit is our most urgent need. Yes, we need food in the morning. We need shelter at night, especially when it's cold. We need gas in our car to go on our trips. But our most urgent need in light of the promise that the Lord is returning, our most urgent need is for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
Some may beg to differ, but listen to this. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, friends, I don't know if Portland, Connecticut is quite the end of the earth, but we would have to agree that it's a bit ways from Jerusalem. And perhaps it's a little bit closer to Judea than to Jerusalem, and maybe even a bit closer to Samaria than to Judea. But the point is, is that we, in, we are in one of those hinterlands that Jesus imagined in his mind when he gave that command to the disciples. And that generation, of course, is long gone to their rest. They're no longer trotting the face of this earth. But we are. We are. And the world is in a desperate need for a witness of Jesus. Amen? The world is desperate to see Jesus. Well, how are they going to see Jesus in us? Well, Mark chapter 11, excuse me, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 says this, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, the passage is very straightforward. It's just a, 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 a brief account, Mark's uh, descriptions in comparison to Matthew's descriptions or Luke's descriptions are a little more uh, tight and, and brief. And so for your sake and mine, it's just this very simple um, story that unfolds. Jesus came to be baptized by John. He goes into the water. After he comes up out of the water, the heavens part, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. And then God the Father speaks and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, we have to be really careful here because we can look at this and, uh, and, and think, Well, you know, Jesus was an exception. He got the Holy Spirit. But for the rest of us, you know. But we have to remember the command was given, Wait in Jerusalem. And you will receive it. But notice what Jesus received. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Mark chapter 1. I don't have a favorite chapter, but I have a lot of favorites. One of them is Mark chapter 1. Why Mark chapter 1? Because I'm fascinated. It gives us a kind of a telescopic view of, of a day in the life of Jesus. It happened to be a Sabbath. He went into the synagogue. Apparently, he was scheduled to teach that day. And in this particular passage, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, it's the story where a demoniac spoke up in the middle of the church service and said, we know who you are. And as the story unfolds, here's what it says, Mark chapter 1, 
They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked the demons, told the demons to be quiet and come out of him, and the demons came out. The Bible says, immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. After church that day, instead of going downstairs for potluck, they went to Peter's house. And they had lunch. And while they were there, having lunch, it was brought to Jesus' attention that Peter's mother-in-law was not feeling too well. She was sick. She had a fever. Possibly malaria or some other, uh, ravaged by some other disease of that time and, and space. So he came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. And then she began waiting on them. The Bible goes on to say this very same day, in verse 32, At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered at the door. And then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, we've got to stop and think here for a moment. It wasn't just a busy day, but it was a busy night as well. It says, at evening, when the sun had set. He had already had a pretty exciting day. He was teaching. He'd cast out a demon. He had healed an elderly lady. But now after the sun had set, the whole city came to, his, to the doorsteps of Peter's house. I can imagine he was up pretty late that night. And he was tired. But the question that begs to be asked is, how did he do all that? How did he do it? The Bible says when he was baptized, he received the Holy Spirit. It's very clear that he received the Holy Spirit. But what happened after that? The very next verse in Mark chapter 1 is very telling. Verse 35. It says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So let's picture this in our minds on that very busy Sabbath day after sundown when the whole city came to him and he healed many of their sick and afflicted and cast out demons. The Bible doesn't say at what time he lay his head to rest, if he did that at all. But it seems to indicate that he got some shut-eye because verse 35 tells us, Now in the morning, having arisen a long while before daylight. So maybe two hours before sunrise? Maybe three? But it says he did something. It says he prayed. 
He prayed. And what's, what's amazing is what takes place next, because then his disciples come to him. Simon and those uh, who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone's looking for you. And why not? Why not? Wouldn't you be looking for somebody who could heal your mother-in-law and cast out a demon out of your child? Right? But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. The point being is that they wanted him to stay there and do more work. He says, no, we're going to go on and do more work elsewhere. Doesn't mean they're never going to come back there. It means he wanted them to get the understanding of the depth and the breadth of the scope of the work that they were called to do. Okay? Is God willing to give us the Holy Spirit today? Luke chapter 11. I'm going to close on this verse. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. You, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, Will he offer him a scorpion? These are all, of course, rhetorical questions. And the obvious answer is no. You would never do that to your child who asks. And so Jesus concludes, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. Friends, the Holy Spirit is our most urgent need. There is no greater need than the Holy Spirit. And the reason is simple. Because with the Holy Spirit comes all of God's blessings. All of God's blessings. Without the Holy Spirit, we are absolutely powerless. We're cowardly, we're lazy, and we're disobedient. The Holy Spirit is our most urgent need. My question is, Do you want the Holy Spirit? Do you want the Holy Spirit? I say that to those gathered here as well as to our online audience. If you sense, after today's message, if you sense, yeah, this is making sense, not because I said it, but because the Word of God spoke. If you are convicted that you need the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has been convicting you. Does that make sense? I'm done. But the Holy Spirit is going to pursue you. And the quick, easy solution is simply this. To ask God and to say, yes, Yes, Lord, I need the Holy Spirit. I know I need the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I need the Holy Spirit. And so I'm asking, if you need the Holy Spirit, would you just acknowledge that with with just raising your hand? I'm going to raise my hand, okay? I need the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. And for our audience out there, you can maybe type something in and Joy will see what you're typing and and responding. Let's pray. Lord, you have promised your church that you would grant us your presence, the Holy Spirit. We are in such need. It is our most urgent need. We cannot be your witnesses in Jerusalem, let alone Portland, without your Holy Spirit. Here we are, Lord, 2,000 years later, we're still waiting for the promise of your coming. But if we are to take the counsel of your scripture to heart, we are not to so much focus on the times or the seasons, but on the importance of being your witness. And although that may seem like a frightening, almost daunting task, it is possible with the power of your Holy Spirit. So, Father, I pray. I pray for us gathered here. You saw the hands that went up. We are in need, like this woman at the well, to have our cup filled. Because the things of earth, even the church embracing the things of this earth to attract the world, will fail. What's needed is God in us. We just celebrated Christmas. Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Jesus departed, he promised, I will send the comforter. So, Father, send us the comforter. Send us because that is our most urgent need. And we thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.